Okay. I'm going to be a guide, and together we are going to tour the fortress. I shall point out famous buildings and structures. All you have to do is look at them, and then I'll tell you something of their history. Got it? Yeah. yeah. History of the Tower of London can be a bit grim. Some people might get upset. If you are one of those people, two words of comfort for you. Toughen up! <laughs> now you might wonder why a tour guide would say such a thing, and you can wonder about that to your heart's content. The ships could be passed down father to son. If there was no son, they could be sold for 250 guineas. 250 guineas was an enormous sum of money in 1485. More money than a soldier would ever see in his life. So being soldiers and liking the good life, they immediately sold their waterships <laughs> to people who could afford them. And that's how it went on. The people who could afford the waterships weren't necessarily the best people to look after the fortress, to look after the king, to look after the crown jewels. And you'd think we'd get a grip of this situation pretty quickly. We didn't. It took centuries. It was not until 1826 when the Duke of Wellington, a great man, a great soldier, ask any Frenchman, was appointed as constable of the Tower of London and he said that from now on only deserving, yeah. gallant, yeah. meritorious, yeah. discharged sergeants of the army could become yeoman warders. So that's how I got the gig. I did 23 years in the army, I was a combat medic and I retired as a company sergeant major. But standards have fallen. There are now five from the Royal Air Force. No one talks to them. There are three from the Royal Marines and there's three from the Royal Navy and you can spot that lot. They're usually holding hands and skipping in some sort of dance routine that they were forced to do on ships and we have mocked them for centuries. A lot of my colleagues are married. Some of them are happy, the others have children. But we all live here. This is our home. So there are parts of the tower that are out of bounds to you. These are clearly marked with signs saying out of bounds or private or do not enter. There is even passive signage. And you're looking at me and you think, I don't know what passive signage is. That is passive signage. That rope. You can easily step over it. You could limbo under it. But you didn't because you get the idea that we don't want you there. A lot of the railings in the Tower of London are quite low to enable you to enjoy the view. This means you could easily step over them. But if you do that, you're in the wrong place. This is a royal palace, there are armed guards. If you do trespass, it is possible, it's not likely, but you might get shot. <laughs> By all means, allow your children to explore. <laughs> I like to talk about things we can see at the moment. We're not looking at what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is a beautiful thing. It's over there. The thing of beauty that you see is the Union flag. Here with these easterly winds, not lifting it too much. It's still beautiful, even in its draped position. <laughs> On the side of the beautiful Union flag are crowns etched in gold leaf and beneath these are weather vanes depicting the royal standard. This reminds us that the Tower of London is a royal palace. It has been a royal palace for nearly a thousand years and a thousand years will give you perspective. And perspective is something that we have lost. Yeah, look this way, get closer. I want to share something with you now. We have lost perspective. We're scared. It's not our fault, it's the media. The media want you scared. The media want you to believe that the world has never been as bad, mad, crazy or dangerous as it is right now. And quite frankly, that is fake news. It's fake. It's fake news. <laughs> it's always been bad, mad and scary and I can prove it. There is nothing new going on in the world today. In 1220, Henry III lived in the White Tower, just under that Union flag. And he didn't like it. He said, I don't like it. I don't like it. These Londoners, they're too close. I don't like them. Bad people. Bad people. You've got to keep them out. Got to keep them back. We're going to build a wall. It's going to be a great wall. Who's going to pay for it? They are. <laughs> Henry III levied a tax on the people of London to build a wall to keep them out. Going on in Mexico. All right? But the media would have you believe it's the craziest thing that's ever happened. I think one wall would be enough. No. Nope. The outer one. Right, stop. I am going to have to ask you to stop. There are people around you who are being distracted by your translation. You can do it, but do it at the back of the group. Do you understand? Off you go. Just at the back of the group. All stop.
Right. I think one wall would be enough. The outer wall was built in the 1280s by Edward I, and he surrounded it with a moat. The moat is drier than you'd expect. It's also quite a bit wider. 130 feet across is further than an archer could shoot accurately. Our archers on the ramparts could shoot down on anyone trying to cross the moat in relative safety from anyone on the far side who had a real long shot to get to them. Twice a day the tidal flow of the River Thames would flood in and ebb out and this kept the moat clean. Clever? Yeah. No. Now at low tide the moat dried out and when there was an enemy they just ran across. It was a complete <laughs> waste of time. That was Watt Tyler. Watt Tyler led the Peasant Revolt across the moat in June of 1381 and they ran through the fortress stealing things. Weapons, food, clothing, armour. The Archbishop of Canterbury, they stole him. <laughs> he was Simon of Sudbury, they took him up to Tower Hill. They didn't even want him. I know they didn't want him because they tore off his arms and legs, they disemboweled him and they cut off his head. And before any of you said they shouldn't have done that to a man of God, you have to understand that this particular man of God had introduced a poll tax and he was robbing the very people he should have been looking after. So serve him right, yeah? <laughs> serve him right, yeah? yeah? That's right. No taxation without... Representation. Representation, yeah. Fairly easy to establish when the Americans are in the audience. <laughs> yes. And again, nothing new going on in the world. Nothing new going on in the world. Nothing new. 1776, America was part of the greatest union of trading nations that the world had ever seen. That great union of trading nations was, of course, the BE, the British Empire. But America didn't like it, did you, America? No! Didn't like paying homage to a king you'd never met. No! Didn't like paying taxes to a government you'd not elected. No! So you had a referendum, and you voted. Emma Rexit. <laughs> and you left and it was a no deal Emma Rexit. the only deal we got was bombs, bullets, bayonets, blood and that barbarity at Boston when you savages threw tea in the sea <laughs> it's all happened before it was all about representation wasn't it America but now the media would have you believe that the representation has gone so mad it won't be long before you're begging Her Majesty to take you back <laughs> well, America, soon we might be able to do that because it's exactly the same reasons you've left us. Britain's trying to leave the EU. <laughs> so there's nothing new going on in the world today. I want you to remember that. Nothing new going on in the world. This stuff goes on all the time. You don't need to have a cow about it. All right? Things always turn out for the best because there's enough smart people around to make sure that that happens. Okay? So relax. <laughs> Unlike Richard II. Richard II had a total meltdown. His palace had been ransacked. His archbishop had been murdered, so he called in a consultant to have a look at the moat. This consultant, and we did have consultants in the 14th century, his name was Master Walter. He came from Holland in the Netherlands, and he did what all consultants do. Took a barrel load of money and left us with a sentence. He said, hey, you know, you should dig the moat deeper than the riverbed, yeah? <laughs> That's what we do in Holland. It will never fully drain and will always present an obstacle. Why we hadn't thought of that, remains a bit of a mystery. Any kid who's ever dug a sandcastle could have done something like that, but that's what we did. Clever? Yes. Clearly not, no. <laughs> Secondary function of the moat was that of toilet. Two and a half thousand people living inside the fortress, tens of thousands around the outside, and every one of these people, most of them more than once a day, adding to the contents of the moat. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? What am I talking about, dear? What am I talking about? Poo is what I'm talking about. Don't be churlish about it. Everybody does it. Poo, right? Poo doesn't always float, does it? You've noticed that, haven't you? You've noticed that? Poo doesn't always float, does it? Where did you notice that? Was it in a swimming pool? Was it you? Was it her? <laughs> Poo floated all the time. It wouldn't be a problem. The tide would carry it out and washed upon the shores of Belgium, where, let's face it, no one would have noticed nor cared. But it's safe. <laughs> At low time, the moat was little more than a mire of raw human poo. Carcasses from the meat market at Smithfield were dumped here, plague victims were tossed here. Whenever it rains in London, and it rains a lot in London, the streets got a much needed wash. All the horse poo, the dead rats, the offer from the butchers, everybody's chamber pots filled into this moat. We had everything in here. Typhoid, anthrax, plague, polar bears. And that's right, we had polar bears in the moat. I'm not allowed to make this stuff up. Uh, Tower of London was the first zoo anywhere in Britain. Housed the Royal Menagerie. 
Nobody knows why we started a royal menagerie, but we do know when. In 1254, for no reason ever recorded, the King of France sent England an elephant. The English had never seen an elephant before. I suspect the army spent a few days just staring at it, waiting for the French to come out. <laughs> we don't know a lot about animals, but we know our warfare. And we weren't falling for any French tro Trojan elephant trick. We were given lions and tigers too. The polar bears were a gift from King Hakon IV of Norway. They were allowed to swim in the moat to catch fish. As you can now imagine, that wasn't all they caught. Uh, they caught cholera and, and, and died. So as a toilet, the moat was a bit of a failure. But as a line of defence, I think you'll agree, <laughs> more than adequate. But it stank, and this is a royal palace. You don't put up with a smell like that in a royal palace. The moat didn't last very long. A mere 500 years later, uh, in 1483, it was drained, it was filled in 15 feet, five metres to the height you see today, and it was then laid to lawn. But if you want to know the level of the water, it's the top of that dark line on the wall. Right? So you are below the level of the Thames at the moment. Quite a lot below it, yeah. That wall there, that top of that wall, is now the current level of the Thames. So if we do flood, good luck. <laughs> right, okay. So there you are. Um, now, the, the lawn was then put to use as an exercise ground for soldiers. But look how green and fertile the grass is. <laughs> now, on the outer side, uh, on the outside of the moat, we've got Tower Hill. Some of you may have come in through the tube station there and you might have passed through a garden called Trinity Green. Um, when you go back tonight through there, have a look. Trinity Green became the site of the public execution scaffold. Many executions associated with the Tower of London took place up there where people could see. Amidst this would stand a man clad in leather. A leather mask covered half his face. It has always been possible to buy this kind of clothing. <laughs> I know one or two of you know where, uh, but for those of you who don't, those of you who don't, just ask one of our Royal Marines. They'll be only too happy to point you in the right direction. Especially Steve, he's right into his leather. <laughs> right, the leather clad man is obviously the executioner. The tools of his trade are fairly straightforward. Block of oak, rest the neck on, an ax. Not any old axe, a war axe. It was considered noble to have your head removed with a weapon of war. Arguably the most noble execution to take place up there was that of Sir Thomas More. Sir Thomas More was the Lord Chancellor in England and that office has a nickname. It is known as the King's Conscience, the top lawyer in the land. It is the job of the Lord Chancellor to tell a king or queen if they're acting against the public interest. Thomas More's king was Henry VIII. Yeah. Henry VIII wanted to be head of the church in England as well as head of state. Thomas More stepped up and did his job. You can't do that, he said. Too much power in one man can only end in tyranny. And not to prove his point or anything, Henry VIII imprisoned him in the bell tower there for 15 months just for saying that. But in July of 1535, he ordered his execution. Thousands gathered up there, heard his last words, and they were simple yet profound. I die the king's true servant, he said. I shall always be God's servant first. Pray for our king. He rested his neck on the block of oak. The executioner brought down the axe, took off his head with one stroke. The head was then impaled on a soldier's pike. Paraded through the streets of London, the head was then left on London Bridge as a warning to other traitors and would also have served as an early form of bird feeder. <laughs> Environmentally friendly. <laughs> Headless corpse was brought back inside the fortress a burial in the chapel where we shall end our talk. Now, speaking of beheadings, this is my favourite bit. Speaking of beheadings, let's beheading off. I know, I wrote that myself. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, you don't pay for this tour. Uh, we're going into the fortress through the only landward entry, the Bywood Tower. It's an example of a Barbican Tower. Two turrets with a gateway in the middle. As we go through the gateway, look up, you'll see the spikes of the portcullis, the drop gate. The drop gate weighs one and a half tonne. It dates from 1286, and so does the rope which holds it up. <laughs> We're gonna go through there really quickly. If you're gonna be slowed down by children, shove them, 
And the same applies to all these old people we seem to have picked up. Just keep them moving. Got it? Yeah. Good, let's go. Come on, quicker than this. What we're going to talk about now is, is this, this is Water Lane. This is Water, you, you can hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Right, this is Water Lane. Um, it's called that because up until the year 1275, where we're standing now is actually the River Thames and you'd be drowning now. I'm just enjoying the thought. Um, <laughs> now when the outer wall was built, it was a tremendous feat of military engineering. Uh, the river had to be pushed back and you've got to remember that there was nothing more than shovels and sweat doing this. They, they pushed the river back, they built this railway up 20 feet to the height that we're on now and then they built the outer wall. And the outer wall had a river entrance, this is it. This is the world infamous Traitor's Gate. <laughs> Sound effects, you don't, you don't pay extra, I'm just bouncing it off the water there. Traitor's Gate is not its original name. Originally, it was known as the Watergate. See? Oh, no. I'll get over it, America. <laughs> <laughs> Boats and barges would come into this little dock and they would offload stores and provisions and for that reason, it very quickly became known as the Traders' Gate. Oh, okay. The Traders' okay. Gate. Mm -hmm. Traders' Gate, mm -hmm. right? 16th century, something of a human traffic, largely one way. A lot of these people accused of treason, and the watermen on the river knew this, and they're cockneys, all of them. And one of them was rowing bow one day, and he looked at it and he thought, oh, it used to be Trader's Gate, now it's Trader's Gate, isn't it? Trader's Gate, Trader's Gate, da 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 Oi! <laughs> Earliest example of Cockney rhyming slang. Really? Yes, that is an alternative fact. Thought, okay. <laughs> right? Alternative. Now we've had some, yeah, it, it, there's no truth in it. <laughs> <Right. laughs> we've had some fairly famous traitors come through here. Um, I've already spoke about Sir Thomas More, but we also had Queen Anne Boleyn. Henry VIII's second wife, traitor. Queen Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife, traitor. Um, and I'll speak more of those two later when I show you where they were killed and where they lie to this day. Guy Fawkes! The only man to have entered Parliament with honest, noble intentions, a clear agenda and the resources to see it through. Something you're not going to find in government anytime soon. One moment. Be quiet! and move on. I am trying to give a tour here. <laughs> Off you go. That's right, miss, I'm available for child minding. Off you go. <laughs> yeah. Guy Fawkes was caught in the process of blowing up Parliament. Make no mistake, he was a suicide bomber. There is nothing new going on in the world today. Guy Fawkes had been told by his religious masters to kill King James I and his parliament who had authorised the writing of a Bible in English. It all sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? He was promised a place in heaven. He got caught. He would have been killed in the blast. They were desperate to know who was in Guy's gang and Guy said nothing. When he was brought to the tower, he was taken over there to Queen's house. That very large window at the top of Queen's house, just above the one with the Juliet balcony, is the council chamber. In there, he was interviewed. <laughs> they said, what's your name? He said, Guy Fawkes. What were you doing? I was going to blow up Parliament, kill the King. Who was with you? I'm not saying. Oh, go on, tell us. No. We'll torture you. Do your worst, he said. They did. <laughs> they took him and bound him by his wrists and ankles to two spindles. These spindles were set in the rack. By means of a ratchet mechanism in the middle, the spindles would turn in opposite directions. He began to stretch. On the rack, you can stretch a man four inches. At the three inch point, any therapeutic value is lost <laughs> and your joints get pulled apart. Joints are held together with ligament and tendon and these are stronger than bone. When your joints get pulled apart, it is in fact your bones that break, but not cleanly. They come away in a flake fracture. It covers a lot of surface area and nerve endings. Pain! Lots of pain! That's what we're talking about here. They all cracked on the rack. Some say Guy Fawkes didn't, but he did sign a confession, good as a death warrant. He was taken from here to Westminster Palace Yard. He was to be hanged, drawn and quartered. This meant that he would be hauled up, choked, let down, revived and then disemboweled. 
His own beating heart held in front of his face as it was thrown into a brazier. His head would then be taken off and his body would be hacked into four pieces. But his racking had been so brutal that as he weighed his way up the gallows steps, he collapsed and died. But they carried on anyway. <laughs> on a happier note, behind you we have the Bloody Tower. Again, this is not its original name. Originally it was known as the Garden Tower, but we changed it for marketing purposes. <laughs> That's absolutely true. There is no reference of this as anything but the Garden Tower until the middle of the Victorian period, when, spookily enough, we opened up to paying visitors. <laughs> what the Victorians were trying to do was anchor the stories associated with the tower into certain locations so they were better explained. One of those stories was of the boy king, Edward V, who was 12, and his younger brother, Richard, the Duke of York, who was nine. Here's the facts of that story. They did exist. Mm. Their uncle was Richard, Duke of Gloucester. He was constable of the tower. During the Civil War, the War of the Roses, he brought his nephews here for their protection. Fact. He had Parliament declare his nephews to be bastards. They couldn't keep the crown anymore. He took it and became King Richard III. Fact. The boys disappeared. Fact. There were rumours at the time that they were spirited away to Ireland. Fact. It is a fact that there were rumours that they were spirited away to Ireland. <laughs> However, two years later, the Battle of Bosworth, Henry Tudor defeats Richard III, and with no real claim to the throne, he takes the crown from Richard's dead head and declares himself king. He couldn't have done that if these boys had been alive, but at the time, no one really thought they were dead. And that's a fact. It is also a fact that if they were murdered, he might have done it. Fact. Elizabeth I was Henry Tudor's granddaughter. She enjoyed the company of playwrights. She liked to be entertained. And her most famous playwright was William Shakespeare in his story of Richard III. He clearly lays the blame and the murder for these two boys here in the tower. But there is no hard evidence to suggest that ever happened. It's equally true that Elizabeth I's grandfather could have had those boys murdered, but Shakespeare couldn't write that because Shakespeare really wanted to keep his head. It is an important lesson that history is not the past. History is never what it was, it's only ever what it is, the story of the past. The story of the past is writ large and embellished by the people who win. This explains why French history books are quite slim and volumes of British history cover shelves all over the world. That's right, France, in your face, yeah. <laughs> history is also a dynamic. It doesn't sit in the past and it has this habit of bubbling up centuries later. 1674, workmen on the south side of the White Tower remove a stone stairway and discover the remains of two small people. Mm. Experts at the time declare them to be the bones of the princes. Fast forward. Mm. Those bones are laid to rest in Westminster Abbey in Innocent's Corner, named in their honour by Charles II. Fast forward. 1933, George V orders the bones to be examined by modern medicine. Modern in 1933 and it was inconclusive as to whether they were male or female. Fact. Fast forward. Year 2002. I became a yeoman warder. I am told to tell people that Richard III was chopped up on the battlefield of Bosworth and his body parts thrown into the River Saw. That was in the history books. The history books were wrong. Fast forward 10 years to 2012. Richard III is discovered completely intact under the social services car park in Leicester where he's been quite comfortable for the last 600 years. <laughs> he was positively identified with DNA from a known descendant. A Canadian! <laughs> I know, I, I was disappointed too. Yeah. Those DNA markers though will be present on those bones in Westminster Abbey if but only if they are his nephews. And what's fascinating is 
that George V said that those remains should be left to rest in peace. Be quiet! Thank you. So we are not going to check the DNA. There is a real opportunity to put this myth to rest once and for all, but we're not going to take it. It would rather ruin the story. What we do know about the Bloody Tower is that it is an absolute marvel of medieval defensive architecture. It is one of 13 towers on the inner wall, but it was the only way in. As an attacking army, you'd have lost dozens, possibly hundreds of men, trying to get through that festering bog of a moat, wrestling with the polar bears, trying to climb the wall. And all the time you're doing that, there are people trying to kill you. It's unlikely you'd have got this far, but if you did, unlucky. The gates are closed. Two and a half ton, oak and steel portcullis, 700 years old, perfect working order. Beyond it, those gates weigh a further three ton. Five and a half tons of oak and steel that you're going to have to act through with your poxy little swords. And that'll take time. A luxury you don't have in battle. The defenders on the ramparts and fighting tops would now be hurling vicious verbal abuse at you. <laughs> Not to mention stones, arrows, buckets of boiling waste, cows, sheep, salad, unwanted children. Everything will be thrown at you. It's not a healthy place to stand, so we're not going to. We are going to charge in. Charge is a military term, and it means to move rapidly to engage in eager combat with the enemy. So let's not have the Italians at the front. <laughs> right. If anyone's not yet been offended, let me know. I will try and fit you in. Let's go. Come on, quick, hold the Austrians. This is the Norman Keep, the White Tower, built on the orders of a Frenchman. That's right, France. This is your moment. <laughs> he was William, Duke of Normandy, but he was better known as William the Bastard when he defeated Harold II at the Battle of Hastings on October the 14th, 1066. Christmas Day that year, he's crowned King of England and his spin doctors got to work. By the year 1078, he's known as William the Conqueror and he stupidly chose to build his principal palace here under the approach lanes to two airports! <laughs> Total lack of foresight. <laughs> Been a palace for nearly a thousand years. For nearly 500 years, our kings and queens lived on the top floor. The floor below was accommodation for their more favoured knights and ladies. The lowest floor within those, that's where the kitchens were, where the servants and soldiers were billeted. There is... However, another floor. There is, however, another floor. <laughs> this floor is partly below ground. The walls there are five meters thick, 15 feet thick. There are no windows. It's dark. We're close to the river below the water table. It is always damp and cold. But this was the perfect place for the, the wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a palace, hello. Right, palace and fortress are built to keep people out. Prisons are built to keep people in. Think it through. We didn't. <laughs> Our first prisoner was a Frenchman. His name was Rano de Flambard. He was the Bishop of Durham. Now, it'd be complete insanity to lock a French bishop, or believe me, any bishop, in a wine cellar. <laughs> I know this to be true. I was an altar boy for three years. But first lesson, keep the bishop away from the wine, Billy. That was what this was. Right after Flambard was in prison in the top of the southwest turret, this one here, in the year 1100, got to know his borders really well. He would listen to their confessions. He'd also offer them plenary indulgence. Now, I know a lot of you don't know what that is, so I'll explain as best I can, as simply as I can. Plenary indulgence is credit in the bank of sin. It's forgiveness for sins you've not yet committed, but you might want to in the future, and you're covered. It is an insurance policy for heaven. <laughs> like all insurance policies and credit schemes, it relies on an outlay of money and what God ever needed with money, the bishops never fully explained. But they were all fabulously wealthy. I want you to make no mistake on this, the bishops of the Middle Ages were charlatans. 
ran after Flambard, was no exception, he was loaded. He didn't need money from the warders, but he did like wine, and that's how they paid him. Wine brought up from the cellar in casks that were bound round with rope. And you might know where this is going. In the habit of drinking with his warders one night, they drank too much, they fell asleep. He saw his moment and seized it. He removed the rope from these casks, and this French bishop repelled 90 odd feet on an improvised line and got away. Our first prisoner escaped. <laughs> he was our only prisoner at the time. <laughs> one job! We had one job! Later, of course, the Tower of London became the most notorious prison in the world. But for years, we had a 100% escape record. <laughs> and I find that reassuring. I find it a comfort because it echoes the truth in life. And you kids going through a hard time at the moment, going through difficulties with school and everything else that you've got to put up with as kids these days. You've got to remember this. It's not where you start that matters. It's where you finish that counts. And I want you kids to look at me. Because this is true. I failed at school. I didn't even go to secondary school. I never went. From the age of 11 onwards, I just played in the woods. My friends went to school. They worked very hard. They got their certificates. Some of them went to university. But here's something about my friends from school. None of them live in a castle. <laughs> This tells us, kids, that school is not important. <laughs> yeah. And remember, kids, if you fail at school, the army will nearly always say, welcome. <laughs> Left the army with a degree in history and a degree in paramedicine. So there you go, take your time, do it right. Enjoy the woods while you're young enough. <laughs> Sorry kids, but a lot of you do know, a lot of you kids know, a lot of you kids know that the world is going to blow up and burn soon and that we're going to have to go and live on Mars. Some of you are going to have to go to school. <laughs> In the White Tower today you're going to see wonders. There's the armour of the king, shield, lance, sword, bayonet, rifle, pistol, musket, cannon, mortars, all the good stuff in there. And you are quite right. That lower chamber did become a place of torture and it remains one to this day. It's a gift shop now. <laughs> <laughs> on now to Tower Green and the heart of darkness in English history. Let's go, come on, quicker than this. Quicker than this. Half a dozen, I don't know, maybe a dozen of you, but possibly most of you, um, have just come here for the crown jewels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's always the shallow ones. Um, <laughs> No, because you're interested in their history, you're not. You just want to make the man you're with feel inadequate. <laughs> and you will. <laughs> Under that clock over there, you'll find a door. When you go through the door, you'll see the world's largest perfect cut diamond at 530 carats. It's about the size of an egg. Don't compare your pitiful engagement ring <laughs> to the Star of Africa. You'll also see what is largely regarded as the world's most beautiful diamond, the Koh i Noor, the Mountain of Light. The light of India. As their name suggests, we've stolen them from everywhere. <laughs> her Majesty's government, however, insists, I tell you, they were given to us by grateful nations. <laughs> <laughs> did you see that, Josie? Did you see what I did there? I was being made to say something. So I changed my voice and my demeanour. So you all knew that wasn't me. <laughs> When you're asked to apologise to your sister, that's what you do. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Same goes for you too, Peter. Okay. Don't let them get at you. Don't let them wear your soul away. Now, crown jewel is very important to us. They're being guarded today by soldiers, and I do mean soldiers, yeah, the Welsh Guards. The See them there in their famous red tunics and basking caps. That's right, children. Bear skin caps. They're called bear skin caps because they're made from a bear's skin. And I know that sounds cruel, children, but the bears don't need the skin anymore. They're dead. <laughs> it's not us that kills them, it's the government of Canada. 
Okay. Every year, Canada has to have a cull of its bears, and if it didn't do this, Canada would be overrun with bears. <coughs> there'd be no more beavers, there'd be no more elk, there'd be no more wolves, the bears would eat them all. And once they've done that, they're going to start on the restaurants. <laughs> you won't be able to get any food because it'll be full of bears. <laughs> They'll, they'll go to the pubs, pubs will be full of bears, you won't be able to get a drink, you won't be able to get a bus home because it'll be full of drunken bears. There'll be no more maple syrup because the bears don't know how to make it. But on the upside, there'd be no Celine Dion or Justin Bieber. So swings and roundabouts. Look closely at the soldiers, you will see that they are wearing the Afghanistan medal. This particular company of the Welsh Guards has recently returned from combat operations in Afghanistan where they've been teaching the Afghan National Army to fight. The weapon they are armed with is, for those of you from the NRA, <laughs> the L1 A3 SA80 Heckler & Koch 5.56mm assault rifle with a 30 round magazine. 31 if you bend the spring, put one up the spout. That is 32 rounds you can fire on single or burst fire mode with 1,800 feet muzzle velocity and <coughs> lethal and accurate to 1,200 metres. Do not upset the soldiers. <laughs> Got it? Good. They do deserve your respect. Anyone with an assault rifle and bayonet deserves a degree of respect. Especially if you don't have an assault rifle or bayonet. <laughs> uh, this is tar green. It's colour coded. It's the grass. I have to explain this. A lot of people spend an hour or so looking for a green tower. These people are Austrians. <laughs> I got round to you in the end. Yeah. Yeah, all oh, Germans, yes. They're, oh, I see no Austrians. I only see Germans. Yes, Germans, yeah. Because Germans are beautiful people, Austrians, beautiful people, but they have syntax problems and talk like Yoda. So, for the Germans and the Austrians. Thou <laughs> agree? Grass it is. A <laughs> tower it is not. Explain for you, I have. Hopefully that's cleared that up. <laughs> Come visit the Beecham Tower. <coughs> that arch window up there lets light into a chamber, the walls of which are covered with graffiti, and some of that graffiti is nearly 500 years old. The last words of dying men. Graffiti is clearly not a new problem. Modern art is a new problem. <laughs> this monstrosity! Not, not you, not you. <laughs> Perspex granite tubular steel is a monument to traitors and mutineers. It shouldn't exist. This is the site of the private execution scaffold. A private execution scaffold. It was here that Henry VIII had two of his wives beheaded. And as you can see, many husbands take their wives back to admire the spot. <laughs> I'm going to speak about these executions in the comfort of the chapel. The chapel over is a place of Christian worship, so gentlemen, you're going to have to do what I do and remove your headdress before you go inside. If you have a mobile phone, switch it to silent. I used to tell you to switch it off. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers, welcome to the Chapel Royal of St. Peter. Here since the 9th century, but prior to that, overlapping the site, there was a Roman temple to the warrior cult of Mithras established in 52 CE. That's common era. Uh, we don't say AD anymore. Have to be sensitive to the needs of those people who are offended by everything. So, this has been a place of worship for a variety of gods for nearly 2,000 years. But this particular chapel is brand new. 1519. Think about it. This year, this chapel is 500 years old. There are ghosts here. I have lived at the Tower of London for 17 years. Visitors, friends, and even my family have asked, do you ever see a ghost? The answer is yes, but it's only in here. The thing is, I see it every time I come in here, and I can see it now. <laughs> if you want to see a ghost, 
on your visit to the Tower of London today, all you have to do is look up. This ceiling is the ghost of Henry VIII's love for his first wife. Catherine of Aragon, she was a beautiful Spaniard. Henry loved her so much that he commanded the ceiling should be made of Spanish chestnut so that Catherine, our queen, might worship God under the trees of her native land. <coughs> they were happily married for 17 years, actually married for 23 years. <laughs> the last six years were made miserable because she could not produce a son. She'd given him a daughter, but that wasn't good enough. It rarely is. <laughs> <laughs> what? In historical terms, kings wanted sons. You knew that, didn't you? Of course you did. Two sons, preferably, an heir and a spare. <laughs> Henry should have been the spare. Henry should never have been king. His older brother Arthur should have been king. He was great for it. He was trained for it. He was a great warrior. A great diplomat. Actually, if you're a great warrior, diplomacy comes really easy. <laughs> but Arthur Tudor got the flu. It killed him. Man flu. Worst kind. So when Henry Tudor died, his second son became King Henry VIII. He married Catherine of Aragon to maintain an alliance with Spain. Young as she was, Catherine was already a widow, and her dead husband had been Arthur, Henry's brother. Henry VIII married his sister-in-law. Weird. <laughs> and on that technicality, they were granted a divorce, 23 years into their marriage. He was now free to marry Anne Boleyn. And like Catherine, she gave him a daughter. <laughs> What's your name? Caden. I want you to remember this, Caden. I want you to remember this, Rosie. I want you to remember this, Peter. That daughter turned out to be the greatest person that ever lived. The greatest person that ever lived was, was a girl like you. Not a boy like him. <laughs> the greatest person that ever lived was the daughter of Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. Her name was Elizabeth. And when she became queen, she was Gloriana Regina, the glorious queen. She created the finest thing the world would ever know. She created the greatest thing the world had ever seen and experienced. She created the British Empire. <laughs> and you might think that some crusty old soldier is saying all this and living in the past and it's not relevant and it doesn't matter anymore. I want you to think again. If it was not for Elizabeth I, I would now be speaking to you in Spanish. And you would all understand. <laughs> That's right, Spain. In your face. Yes. <laughs> Might want to remember that next time you bring up Gibraltar at the Brexit table. Anyway. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, greatest person that ever lived, girls? Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. A girl. This is what a feminist looks like. <laughs> Henry VIII was no feminist. Henry VIII wanted son, and Anne Boleyn tried hard, really hard. And not just with Henry. <laughs> Anne Boleyn was found guilty of adultery with five men. One of those was her brother. I don't care what your sentimental attachment is to the myth that is now Anne Boleyn. There is no evidence of anything except the court records, and the court records tell us that Anne Boleyn was found guilty of adultery. With five men, including her brother. When you're married to a king, that's treason. And I don't care who you're married to, it is excessive. And let's face it, just a bit weird. <laughs> Not for her, the block and axe. She opted to go out French fashion with a two-handed sword. On the 19th of May, 1536, she knelt out there praying for forgiveness, and as she prayed, a Frenchman took off her head 
with one stroke of a sword. It was a beautiful job. Beautiful. When her severed head was held up, the witnesses gasped in amazement and horror. The public record tells us her eyes continued to gaze around at the faces in the crowd. And for quite some time, as her neck drained the blood, her lips continued to move. And you've got to ask yourself, was she conscious? And the answer is, I don't know. We'll never know. But if she was conscious, I know what she was thinking. She was thinking, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Anne Boleyn totally expected a reprieve. She'd made no arrangement for a funeral. She'd had 17 days to prepare for this. There was no coffin. Anne Boleyn, Queen of England, obviously quite a bit shorter now, had to be stuffed into a humble arrow box, which was buried about eight inches beneath your feet. You might be sat on it. If it was not, Queen Victoria, another great queen, ladies, another great queen, Queen Victoria, never listened to anybody. She visited this chapel on the 12th of September, 1876, and as she came through the door, she fell over the step. <laughs> Absolutely true, not allowed to make this up. She was not amused. She had come here to examine the works that had been carried out at her request. A new stone floor had been laid. This stone floor was brand new in 1876. Underneath it is a heating system. But in order to do these works, all the bodies had to be exhumed. And Queen Victoria commanded that where possible, the traitors buried here should be identified and given the decent Christian burial they were denied at the time of their death. And that sounds nice. But it's so much more. In spirit, if not on paper, she pardoned them. I can prove it. Queen Victoria commanded that the most notorious queen in England, Anne Boleyn, should be buried in the most sacred part of the church. This is the final resting place of Queen Anne Boleyn. She lies under a flat stone. It bears nothing more than a name and a coat of arms. And I'm pointing to it so you can take a photograph and say, he's <coughs> pointing at Anne Boleyn. <laughs> That's Billy, he's our big Peter. He's pointing at Anne Boleyn. Billy, he was great. Hey, trip advisor, that was Billy. <laughs> he's pointing at Anne Boleyn. Or you can put it on match.com and say, Billy, single, let's get past <laughs> With parking, close to the shop, just not put it out there. I'm on Facebook. <laughs> Amberlynn, good company. Next to her, Queen Catherine Howard. Henry's fifth wife was also guilty of adultery, but she was just 19 when her father and family forced her to marry the king. Henry was 51. He was morbidly obese and had a variety of diseases that today would respond really well to penicillin. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. There was no love in the marriage. She sought comfort outside, she had an affair, she got caught, she admitted her adultery. But here on the scaffold, she proclaimed it. I die, the Queen of England, she said. I'm ready. Much rather would I have lived and died as the humble wife, the only man to have ever loved me, Thomas Culpepper. Well, she probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Thomas Culpepper certainly thought so. Thomas Culpepper was hanged, drawn and quartered. Great names in the story of the tower don't get the great monuments. So Thomas More became Saint Thomas More. He lies just beyond that door in our crypt. These great monuments, you see, are for people you've probably never heard of. Over here in the corner is a magnificent tomb to John Holland. And some wag put some black. He enforced the law in England that said that every boy from the age of 6 to 60 would practice archery for two hours on Sunday. And this upset everybody. 
All the regular working stiffs only got Sunday off, and now he'd robbed two hours of it. They were furious. But the people of Britain, when they're furious, it doesn't last long. In fact, I can give you a demonstration. They went, ah! I'm off to the pub. <laughs> Go to the pub. Have a pint of good British ale. And the anger goes away. The second pint of British ale gets you thinking. By the third pint of British ale, you are a genius. <laughs> but you need a wee. So you go outside to the toilet. And I know you kids love hearing about the toilets. In medieval times, basically, it was just a bit of turned over earth. The landlord might put a few stones in it for the men to aim at, because that's what we do. <laughs> and while they were doing that, one of them might have said, I'm a better shot than you. And they'd have had a competition. And then, ding! We're not going to practice archery on Sunday. We're going to compete. This is genius. Because where there's a competition, there is an unknown outcome. When there's an unknown outcome, there is gambling. Where there's gambling, there's money. Where there's money, there's motivation. And I think he knew that. They weren't practicing for two hours on Sunday. They were practicing for two hours every day, so they were good for Sunday. This gave us thousands of longbowmen. The longbow was the decisive weapon in the Hundred Years' War. A word about the Hundred Years' War. It did not last a hundred years. It was 137, but that just doesn't sink. That war ended on October 25th, 1415, when that man stood next to his king, Henry V, and they were at the head of a pathetic British army of five and a half thousand. They were weak, they were weary, they'd been fighting for months. <laughs> and they were met by a fresh French army of 32,000 in a field next to a castle the French court, as in court. They knew they were going to be slaughtered, but they still took to the field to fight, and there was a slaughter. Of the five and a half thousand British that went into that field, only 28 were killed. Of the 32,000 French, 10,200 fell that day. The slaughter went completely the other way. And the numbers sound beyond belief. And even Henry V didn't believe it. He said, this is a miracle. It is God's will. And maybe he's right. Maybe God doesn't like the French either. But <laughs> when you read the Chronicles, you realise it's all him. The French Chronicles tell us that the flower of their nobility disappeared in a blizzard of arrows that turned the sun black. <laughs> raining on the day, but you get the idea. That man ended a hundred years war, and he's forgotten. In the middle, the tomb of Sir Richard and Lady Elizabeth Chumley. Richard Chumley built this chapel, wanted to be buried here, paid for the tomb himself. He loved it. Couldn't wait to get in it. <laughs> he was a Catholic. He built a Catholic church, but by the time he died, this was a Protestant chapel. He was never buried here. But it's not a waste of money. If you look at that man, you see someone who built something that 500 years later is still in use for its intended purpose. This is the church. If you're in town on Sunday, you can come to service. The service times are on the bulletin boards outside. And if you are coming to church, admission is free. <laughs> Bet you wish you knew that before you bought your tickets online. <laughs> <laughs> Most Saturdays of the year, a young couple will kneel at the altar and before their friends, their family and God. They will declare their undying love, devotion and fidelity to each other as they swap rings on top of two of the greatest adulterers in British history. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you think, doesn't it? Uh, sadly, that's all the time I've got to speak with you, but a few words before I let you go. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask my colleagues as you wander about the town. They'll be only too pleased to talk to you. I do mean that. We don't want you to have a good day here. We want you to have a great day. And if you're not having a great day, come and tell us. We always find that amusing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks.